And here we are at our home in San Pablo that leads into my talk. Uh, we'll be using my own garden in San Pablo as a case study to see how to select native keystone plants for sunny areas. Uh, if you'd like to learn what our San Francisco Bay Area keystone plants are for shady areas, you can go to the tour's YouTube channel and see the talk that I gave on May the 2nd. So here is a before photo of our backyard. Um, when I bought the house, there was a lawn, these weird plants from South Africa. There was a lot of ivy and Himalayan blackberry. Here we are looking at the right-hand side of our backyard. Pete Bayou's hardworking crew from East Bay Wilds took 40,000 pounds of concrete out of our backyard. Here we are looking up the slope and you can take a look at the stairs there in the fort on the right-hand side. We'll be looking at that stair area later. So what to do? We just stripped it bare. And at that point, we had to ask ourselves, why not just garden with drought tolerant plants from Australia, the Mediterranean and South Africa? And it's because plants from Australia the Mediterranean and South Africa provide great habitat for animals, birds, and insects from those areas. But our own local wildlife need our own local native plants. So birders among us, can you tell us what these birds are? You could type your answers into the chats in Zoom or YouTube. I have seen both these species in our own backyard. Before our garden was transformed, we saw little in the way of wildlife, but since then we have seen 30 species of birds in our own small garden in San Pablo. I don't have time to convey his message now, but if you missed Doug Tallamy's talk on the first day of the tour, you can find it on the tour's YouTube channel. And I encourage you to watch it. Doug is an engaging and inspirational speaker, speaker and hearing him change the way I think about my garden. So somebody said acorn woodpecker on the left um, and butterfly people among us. I've also seen this butterfly in my garden. Um, this is a swallowtail. And if you want birds and butterflies in your own gardens, you will rejoice when you see caterpillars. Uh, as Doug Tallamy said, 95% of bird species require caterpillars, thousands and thousands and thousands of them to raise a single clutch of chicks. Baby birds do not eat seeds or berries or sugar water. They need caterpillars. Without caterpillars, we have no baby birds and also no butterflies or moths. But butterflies and moths can lay eggs on only very specific plants, including those plants called keystone species in my garden is a goal of mine. But if we leave the butterflies and moths for a moment, when it comes to attracting wildlife, who doesn't want adorable native bees like this one in the garden? So when we were considering the plants for our garden, our criteria were that they be California natives, preferably local natives, that they flourish in sunny areas, and that they be plants that high numbers of butterflies and moths could lay their eggs on. These are called keystone species by Doug Tallamy. So what plants to select? Now I'm gonna help you figure out how you can do this for your own garden. If you go to the home page on the tours website and look at the bottom where the red arrow is, there's the keynote speaker, Doug Tallamy resources section. And if you go there, you'll find this page. And we're gonna look first at the plant lists, the San Francisco Bay Area native plants and the number of species of butterflies and moths that will lay eggs on them. And we get this list. So this list was provided to me by Doug Tallamy. It's for the San Francisco Bay Area. You'll see the common name uh, there and kind of in the center and the green column on the right is the number of species of butterflies and moths that can lay eggs on that plant. I've sorted this uh, to go from high to low. You can see that the oak is a giant, 270 species of butterflies and moths can reproduce on it. Moving down the list, if I look here under ribes, our native gooseberry, I see 122 species of butterflies and moths can lay eggs on it. So this is a great resource for us and we're so lucky to have it. But we have another great resource as well. And I'm going back to the Doug Tallamy resources page. And I'm gonna look near the bottom for a sample of keystone species for the San Francisco Bay Area. 
So this is my own garden plant list. And while it is a list for my own garden, it could also be useful to you in your garden. Four Dimensions Landscape created this list for me. Uh, as you can see, the plants are divided into form. So whether they're trees or shrubs or vines or grasses, this is just a partial view of that list. If it's a California native, if the plant is a local native, and the Doug Tallamy Index is the number of species of butterflies and moths that can lay eggs on that plant. And then the plants are keyed out or coded, whether they want sun or part shade or full shade. So using this list made it very easy for me to choose the plants of high reproductive value to butterflies and moths that flourish in sunny areas of the garden. Before I go into those plants, I'm gonna show you one more thing. And that is this comparison chart of typical native and non-native plants and their reproductive value to butterflies and moths. So I took Doug Tallamy's data and with my husband's help made up this chart. So here you can see on green are local native plants. And as you can see, they are of high reproductive value to butterflies and moths, California lilac, currants, manzanitas, maple, and on the right in red are the ecological desert plants. These are non-natives that are commonly found in our gardens. They come from other parts of the world and you'll see the ones on the far right have zero value for butterflies and moths. They simply cannot reproduce on them. These include agapanthus, ice plant, periwinkle, red hot poker, tea tree, crepe myrtle, ginkgo, grass, sweet alyssum. If you look at these low bars in red, you can see that maybe six or eight species of butterflies and moths can reproduce on these non-native plants. Tree of heaven, impatience, eucalyptus, cotoneaster. So you can see how the plant choice that you make in your yard will make a huge difference in whether or not you can attract butterflies and moths, uh, whether you can attract birds to your garden, or even in the future if we'll have those species. Um, if you have any of these plants in your garden, you might consider reproducing, re, um, replacing them with our local natives. This is the front of my house. And um, my husband, Mike, and I planted this oak on the left uh, about 25 years ago when it was maybe six inches tall. And we planted this buckeye on the right from a seed 22 years ago. So you can see that it doesn't take long um, to make change in your garden and a big change by starting to put plants in now. So let's go now and look at some of the plants. Now, these are not pictures of my garden. These are pictures of the plants that you might want to put in your garden. And I'm going to move to pictures of my garden in a little bit. So here's a California lilac. Um, this is a centennial. It's a larval host plant for 117 species of Lepidopterans. It wants sun. And uh, this is lovely photo was taken by Pete Bayou from East Bay Wilds. It's a great plant for sunny areas. Uh, it's an evergreen, which provides structure and stability throughout the year. It has these, uh, Ceanothus have these beautiful purple blue flowers that are magnets for butterflies and native bees. Here now is a silver bush lupin. This is an evergreen perennial lupin. It's showy, fragrant, and beautiful. 75 species of Lepidopterans can lay eggs on it. And here's another one of the workhorses of the garden. This is a manzanita. Um, along with California lilac, they're like two structural plants that just keep your garden looking great throughout the year. Manzanita's evergreen. They have gorgeous bark. They're lovely in all seasons. Manzanitas are early bloomers and their delicate urn-shaped flowers appear in late winter and early spring. Like the California lilac, they can be found from prostrate forms to tall shrubs. 68 species of butterflies and moths can lay eggs on this. Here is a ground cover, the California sand strawberry. It's evergreen and it bears a profusion of small white flowers in spring. 58 species of butterflies and moths can lay eggs on it. This photo is uh, naked and red buckwheats. Um, our local naked buckwheat, the creamy one, uh, is, is uh, 
native to our area and the rosy buckwheat is from the Channel Islands. Buckwheats attract butterflies, bees, birds, they're deer resistant. Uh, 50, 56 species of butterflies and moths can lay eggs on these. And this beautiful photo is California goldenrod. It's a showy yellow flowering perennial that blooms in the late summer to fall. 55 species of butterflies and moths can lay eggs on it. And this is aster. Uh, the perennial California aster thrives in full sun to part shade. It's deer resistant. 53 butterflies and moths can lay eggs on it. And here's coyote brush. I love coyote brush. Uh, it's evergreen, deer resistant. It's an excellent habitat plant as it offers food and shelter to a wide variety of insects. It can be found in the ground cover form or as a tall shrub. The shrub makes a good hedge plant. 38 species of Lepidopterans can lay eggs on coyote brush. And this path is lined with penstemon, the purple blue flowers. Penstemon is a long lived perennial with hundreds of showy violet flowers on long spikes. And 30 species of Lepidopterans can lay eggs on penstemon. So now let's go to my garden. We'll look at this before photo one more time. This is looking basically out my kitchen window. And this is the view that I see now. So the uh, purple is California lilac. This photo was taken a couple years ago, but that flower was in bloom like maybe a month or so ago. Uh, the yellow is aquatic monkey flower. In the background here, you can see these tall, fun cow parsnips. It's an annual. And here's a before photo from the right hand side of my yard. So you want to look at the stairs going up the slope. And this was the view uh, shortly after we had the yard redone. And I know it looks like, oh, they put in the lawn. That's unusual. <laughs> but it's actually not grass. It's our native bent grass, Agrostis palins, a little, uh, it's a lovely little grass. Uh, this photo would have been taken in the late summer or fall. You can see the fuchsia blooming on the hill. And here's a uh, buckwheat blooming up here. And here's the fuchsia in our garden. And here um, we have California buckwheat on the left. This is a uh, fasciculatum. It's a, a rather large buckwheat. Here's the aster on the upper on the right, kind of barely visible over here are the magenta flowers of the hummingbird sage. They smell fantastic, this uh, hummingbird sage. And down here is a ground cover. We have woodland strawberry and yerba boina and some redwood sorrel. And then on the right here are these huge like elephant ear leaves of the cow parsnip. It's an annual that just recedes every year and it grows so fast. It sends up these enormous leaves and gets these tall shoots and uh, spreads its seed and comes back every year. What I wanted was a garden that was productive for people and wildlife. So in our garden, in addition to natives, we have about a dozen fruit trees. And here on the right, you can see the um, uh, trunks of some of them. On this side of the yard, we have a fig, plum, persimmon, strawberry guava, and an apple. On the other side of the yard, we have um, orange and mandarin, lemon, lime, guava, cherimoya. So this is a close-up of the aster that's on our stairs. And here I'm standing probably in maybe like February or something at the top of the stairs looking down. So we don't see a lot of flowers right now, but here's the fuchsia on the right hand side. Here's blue eyed grass. It's just such a tough plant growing up between the steps along with some bunch grass. This is the aster. Here's these fun cow parsnips shooting up here. And there's a persimmon and a strawberry guava. Some people don't like this kind of wild and wooly look, but I do. The yard could be cleaned up more if one likes a tidier look. I just happen to like it that way. Now, here are some photos that also were taken in our yard. Here's a mule's ears. You might have seen this if you've been out walking in East Bay Hills. My mule's ears are in flower right now. 
and uh, they're lovely. Uh, Blue-eyed grass uh, takes, a, takes a hard life. It'll grow up in these harsh conditions like between our stairs. This is our beautiful local native Clarkia that reseeds in my yard every year. I'm getting larger patches of it. Here's Gilia. It's a plant that thrives in disturbed areas and also is a great reseeder that just comes back every year. And we have narrow leafed milkweed. And so for those of you who have grown uh, milkweed and you should be growing our very own narrow leafed milkweed in the Bay Area and not um, milkweeds from other areas, then you also get aphids. And in the beginning when I had milkweed, I like you was grossed out by the aphids and I would go out with the hose or with like soapy water or with a paper towel and like, you know, squish them off the stems with my eyes closed. But after a couple of hosts told me that they welcomed the aphids, um, that they even grew milkweed because it brought in, because they had aphids and it brought in the ladybugs, which brought in the birds, or that they grew sacrificial milkweed specifically because it brought in aphids and birds, I just let it go. And what I found when I quit trying to fight the aphids and hose them off and just watch was that it did bring in the ladybugs and the ladybugs would move up and down the stems like a vacuum cleaner. My husband called it hoovering. And you could see where they had been just uh, chomping on the aphids and they would clean the aphids off. And uh, I realized like that's what's supposed to happen and I quit fighting it and now I don't do anything about the aphids. And next week, uh, our last presentation at 2.30 is gonna be another great presentation from Mei Chen, narrated by Klisha Curley. And it's specifically on uh, milkweeds and aphids and it's called life and death in the garden or life and death on a milkweed plant, I think. So you wanna join us for that if you can. So these days uh, we see ladybugs in our garden. They come uh, onto the milkweed for the aphids. And also I saw this morning, uh, morning doves come to our garden. They mate for life and they come in pairs. This uh, photo of the chickadee was taken on the bulrush in our pond. And it was just a delight when bush tits nested in our yard twice, once right outside of the kitchen window and once right outside of the bedroom window. And we could see those busy parents going back and forth all day long, uh, bringing food to their chicks. That was really a treat to us. Hummingbirds have also nested in the garden, but it's not only wildlife that enjoy the garden. We've used the garden more in the first year after it was converted than we had in the previous 15 years because it was just so nice to be out there. My husband and I have lunch outside often at this little table by the pond. We both work at home and we're busy, but we, when we make lunch, we just carry it outside on a tray. And um, when we're outside watching the birds flit around our garden, I feel like we don't need to go on vacation to be in nature. We don't even need to go on a hike. We're already away when we're there. So uh, I'd like to see, maybe Stephanie, you can let me know if you saw any questions. Um, we have just a couple of minutes to take a question or two, and then we'll move on to our next presenter. Yes, Kathy, I saw a few. I chatted some to you directly. Let me see if I can find them now. Have you actually seen uh, caterpillars on your plants? I know you see a lot of birds and... and uh... I have seen caterpillars on my... Um, Buckeye out front, these beautiful green caterpillars. Um, otherwise, you know, Doug Tallamy says we often don't see them because the birds get them. Um, how do you protect newly planted native plants from gophers? Well, yeah, uh, good question. Um, There's a big question from Linda. Uh, could you also please address fire safety? I'm seeing guidelines about having a large area around the house without trees or shrubs. What if a garden isn't that big? Do you do anything in that regard in your yard? I do not. Now our next speaker, Wendy Dakota, may have something to add about fire safety. I don't consider myself a fire safety expert. Maybe the next time we hold an event, I will bring somebody in to talk specifically about fire safety. But um, I don't feel like really I can talk about that. Here, Gail 
uh, asked, I love dense plantings, but I wonder if plants close to fruit trees compete with each other. Not mine, we still get fruit. Um, it's, uh, it, it works out well to have a native plant um, understory. Um, yeah, I think they, they bring in more pollinators for your fruit tree. I have a lot of bee plants under my pomegranate and apple tree, and uh, I think that helps rather than hurts. One question uh, about the lupins, uh, Kathy. Have you ever had them, didn't, you know, just chowed down by anybody, including rabbits or, um, I don't know, insects? Any problems with the lupins? Somebody had that. Yep, we live in a rabbit-free zone, fortunately, so I don't have them to contend with, but I have had trouble with snails and lupins seem to grow easier in some gardens than others. Uh, I have certainly not had an easy time with lupins, um, but they are such a beautiful plant and they're such a great uh, habitat plant. I think they're worth trying for. Um, let's see, uh, I was wondering about attracting bats to eat mosquitoes. Um, I'm not sure, put up a bat house, but I think that now when I'm going to um, move on to, uh, I'm gonna end my presentation and say again, if you're interested in uh, learning about um, keystone plants for shady areas, you can look at the talk that I gave on May the 2nd. And I hope that this was useful for you to help you um, consider replacing some of the uh, non-native plants in your own garden with our local keystone plants. Uh, this is, uh, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Native Here Nursery your source for local native plants in Alameda and Contra Costa County for supporting the tour. Native Here is a nonprofit nursery dedicated to growing locally native plants that are grown from seeds and cuttings collected in Alameda and Contra Costa counties. Local native plants provide the best habitat for our local wildlife. In addition, every plant you purchase at the Native Here nursery directly supports conservation of California native plants. Native Here is run by volunteers Contact Native Here to see how you can join their knowledgeable team, learn about local California native plants for your own garden, and help Native Here achieve its mission of restoring local gardens and parklands. Visit Native Here online at nativeherenursery.org or call 510-549-0211.